and welcome into the Views from the Sideline podcast. I'm your host, Joey Tysick. Cross from me. That's the podcast <laughs> name there. It's been a it's long, one of those days. It's been a long week. I kind of like great start. freaked out for a second there. <laughs> Across from me is welcome Malika. back to uh, Views. <laughs> hey man, I'm I'm mad that you even picked up on that. <laughs> but um, luckily today I don't have to do as much talking. We're gonna do a lot of college preview show. Um, Malik's gonna get to deep dive into the main conferences, talk about all the shakeups, talk about some of his favorite teams, maybe a couple sleeper teams to watch out for. And I'm going to sit back and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to learn because you know me with college football, it's very up and down. I do my research kind of as the season goes along. Um, but all that, that preseason stuff, that's, that's for the, the hardcore. I'm just not, I'm just not there yet. And I don't think I ever will be. And when it comes to the NFL, I I've gone crazy over the last few years as the more fantasy football that I play, the crazier I get with the NFL. Listen, I, I can understand the love for the NFL is bigger than yeah. college football. It's become worldwide at this point. Mm-hmm. But I'm a college football sicko forever <laughs> to the end. Yeah. And, I mean, I can't I can't fault you for it. Yeah. We all have our our, our issues. <laughs> our guess. vices. Yes. Yes. That's a better way to put it. Better sports than anything else. Yeah. Um. So, to start off, we had a couple things we want to talk about. The Olympics have wrapped up. They're over. We'll see you in four years, two years if you care about the Winter Olympics. I'm in and out about the Winter Olympics. Um, but how did you feel about the Olympics overall? Was it fun time? You miss it already? Uh, the the biggest thing, it's what LeBron and a lot of fans like to call the Avengers getting <laughs> yeah. the gold medal. Steph, LeBron, and KD got it done. Mm-hmm. The last two games, Steph goes for 17 threes. Yeah. <laughs> shoots over 60% from three and the field. Mm-hmm. His legacy is just so cemented at this point. Yeah. He's a borderline top 10 player. I think at this point, I can't put anybody over Magic Johnson as the best point guard ever, but he's it's 1A, 1B. Yeah. It, he's got four championships, the gold medal, and he just had one of the best, probably the best two-game stretch yeah. in Olympics history. And we keep saying, like, if he ekes out one more championship at some point, that's it's hard. Conversations are going to get real reckless if that happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because now he's, he's what, 36? That's something like yeah. that? Turning 37? It's wild to think that these guys are all up there in age. And they're, they're all different players, all different body types. Yeah. And they've all figured it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was fun to watch. Olympic basketball, USA stays strong. The women's team almost lost, though. That was pretty Listen, wild. There was there was a girl I can't remember her first name, but her last name was Williams for Paris. Mm-hmm. She was balling. Yeah, she almost single handedly beat uh, Team USA in the last few minutes. Yeah, I think Team USA for the for the women they, I feel like they messed around a little bit. Too they much didn't at really times. shoot well for most of the time. No, tournament. they like Sabrina Ionescu and Kelsey. She Plum, came off the bench. Them two were like shot well more than anybody. Yeah, and they were the main two that pretty much shot well. Yeah, they basically just relied on Brianna Stewart and Asia Wilson. Yeah, and Asia Wilson was dominating like, as usual. But at the same time, if you're just shooting twos, like the rest of the world is shooting threes nowadays. You yeah. even saw it in the men's. Like Team USA. Serbia almost got them. Yeah, they struggled a little bit because they couldn't defend a three that, that good. Um, it's something to watch out for. Um, but it was fun to watch. Um, all the track events were great. Yeah, Noah Lyles won a gold medal and then got COVID, mm-hmm. quote unquote. Yeah, it was a very weird situation. Very, very messy. Yeah, um, I don't know how to feel about it, um, but it was fun to watch. There were some crazy runs. The um, the women's four by four hundred was insane. Uh, the women's four by one hundred was pretty crazy. Yeah. Shakari Richardson, Richardson, she got a gold. Yeah, she got to <laughs> get revenge after she didn't do great in the 100 meters yeah but in that relay she she was flying um how about quincy wilson 16 years old i feel bad for the kid though i mean it's a cool you you think it's well because he almost could it be all down he oh no because he oh he almost lost them their chance at the final nobody really could have expected him to like be a leader of the team and just like go crazy yeah well i mean he ran really good legs at the trials but in the olympics and i know like for a 16 year old that's the pressure's on wild (laughs) um so he just didn't he just didn't run very well now it's a cool experience like props to the kid to making it he's going back to school with a medal yeah but if if he would have 
been the reason they didn't make the final, I would have felt bad. Would have been tough. But yeah. Um, or when you say Quincy, I think of Quincy Hall. Did you see that his four hundred meter run? That was yeah, that was insane. <laughs> That's one that of the comeback. craziest runs I've ever yeah. seen. That and en- that endurance and that stamina is just ridiculous. Yeah, and like everybody was saying, he looked like he was gonna pass out the whole time, and he just yeah, if he found moving. another gear. Um, so it's fun. The Olympics are over. Um, in 2028, like we mentioned last week, we got flag football coming up. Um, RIP to break dancing. I think it's already over. Yeah, it might and they, be. they got a big meme out of the Australian break yeah, dancer, Ray Gun. It did not go well. <laughs> well, they, they had some really good people, but mm-hmm. it's tough that the meme became more popular than anything. Yeah. Um, so we got flag football coming. Baseball and softball are coming back um, to the Mo- Olympics. Like more than just the World Baseball Classic? Like in the, that's, the Olymp- that's the one everybody in, pays attention to. In the to. Olympics. Baseball and softball. Are- when was baseball in the Olympics? Uh, I've always just remembered the World Baseball Classic. No, it was in there, maybe not the last time, but maybe in... Hmm, it might be longer than that's that. What I, they I, used I, to I have, have no memory of there being baseball in yeah, the Olympics. Yeah, and, and USA Baseball is actually not that great. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, so those are coming back, and then they're adding uh, cricket and something else i can't remember i'm surprised cricket already wasn't a part of it but and then i sense. and then i believe the olympics after that is when they're adding esports <laughs> so 2k in the olympics who's it's, ready it's about to get wild um but as always the olympics were fun and it'll be cool though too now it's going to come back to la so on home soil for us so we don't have to worry so, about weird yeah. times no pressure <laughs> no pressure for real True. this time yeah back here um, a couple other little things we want to talk about. There's been a lot of NFL injuries, a lot of serious ones too, which is unfortunate. Um, we saw early on Chris McCaffrey went down with, um, was that a calf injury, I believe? And so he's been rested the whole preseason, yeah. not going to see him till week one. This week, the Lions had a bunch of scares. Jameer Gibbs went down with a hamstring injury. Um, sounds like he's going to be okay, but they're going to be super cautious with him. He should be good by week one, but we won't see him the rest of the preseason or anything like that. Um, both rookies, Terion Arnold and Ennis Rakestraw, went down with injuries. Um, seems like they're also going to be okay. And Ennis Rakestraw was like the standout guy in the first preseason game. Yeah. Um, another really spooky one, at least for the Chiefs, was Marquise Hollywood Brown with a was it an S S C joint, I believe it is, which is like on your clavicle, and there was like a separation there and supposedly the way that it works, there's some, you know, some veins and things in there that go to the heart. So that can actually be like a life threatening injury, which is why he went to the hospital. Now, apparently he didn't have to have surgery or anything like that. So it sounds like he's, he's going to be good to go, but it's just one of those ones that's scary in the moment. Um, but he should be just fine. He might miss the first couple of weeks of the season, I believe. Um, and then the big one, the news that came out today, unfortunately Malik wearing all his Michigan gear today may have jinxed everything. <laughs> um, J.J. McCarthy, torn meniscus, down for the season. It's a it's a real tough scene. Yeah, Tougher for Vikings fans, when can you catch a break? Yeah. When? We saw you, get, you get the full Sam Darnold experience this mm-hmm. season. Kirk Cousins went down last year. This year they get a rookie. He looked good in his one preseason game. People were starting to think, okay, maybe he can take over pretty early. Um, and now we just won't see him till next year. Yeah, it, it's better to get this done now so maybe he could have a longer career. Yeah. But, yeah, it's it's really tough that he doesn't get to get any looks this first season. Yeah. Next year will be his real rookie season, really. Right. So now, like you said, Sam Darnold gets another shot. Back again. Uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. um, are there any other injuries that you can think of that I forgot? I think those are um, all the major ones, but yeah, there there were some, uh, there were a few other season-ending injuries. I can't remember. I saw, I saw some in college football, so I'm kind of getting them mixed up. But yeah, there's there have been a high amount of injuries. Okay, I can't tell if this is like higher than usual, because there's always knickknack injuries in training camp. But what are there like three or four season-ending injuries so far in the NFL for training camp? Because um, there have been a few other guys that aren't like superstars. Yeah, I'm trying to think like, of what they are or who they yeah. are. I can't remember the names. Yeah. I don't know. Feel bad now. There have been a lot of injuries though. Yeah. Um, and it, it just seems like, you know, that that always happens in football. You get injuries all the time and it, 
it stinks to see that they always come right away. Like as soon as preseason games start, people hit the ground running at full speed and things happen. So yeah. hopefully everybody gets better and we'll see. One more tidbit of news before we move on from the NFL. This could be positive or negative, whichever way you look at it. Nathan Peterman is oh, back. Yeah, I, <laughs> I saw that. Listen, Raiders fans also keep suffering. You got Gardner Minshew or Aiden O'Connell, which I like Aiden O'Connell. Mm-hmm. I don't think he'll ever be a star player. Yeah. I like him. Gardner Minshew, exciting guy that can win you some games. Mm-hmm. And why, why sign Nathan Peterman? What, what's the point? Like, if he wants to transition into coaching, great. Yeah. I've said I think he's probably going to be a good coach because yeah. bad players turn into good coaches. Mm-hmm. But, hey, man, I've good been for talking, him, bad for the Raiders. If anybody has listened to this podcast long enough, they know how I feel about Nathan Peterman. Um, yeah. It's not good. We'll say that. That's why I said it depends on how you look at it. <laughs> um, oh, which does lead me to the other thing. The Lions decided they needed another quarterback. They saw Hendon Hooker, got a concussion, so we didn't see much of him, which led to Nate Sudfeld and proving everybody knows what what it's going to be. Yeah, nothing. He's a bunch of nothing. He's right along with you know all the other backups that he's the Lions not far have off from Nathan Peterman. Yeah, he's not very far off. And I felt like before he looked pretty decent. As a backup. He's had average moments. In spots. But, man, that first preseason game was rough. So, what did the Lions go, go and do? What do you know about Jake from State from, Joey? <laughs> what do you know about him? Uh, He played at Georgia. What uh, do you know about him in the past three or four years, Joey? Uh, He's bounced around multiple teams. Yeah. Yeah. He's more known for controversy than what he's done in <laughs> the past three or four years as a player. Yeah. So, again, it's not like the Lions are looking for him to be the backup Hendon Hooker should still be the backup. Um, it's just going to be depth emergency yeah. uh, quarterback at that point. Maybe a practice squad guy. I don't know. I'm, I don't think teams really keep three quarterbacks most of the time. I think one is destined to be on the practice squad. But I could be wrong. So we'll, we'll see. Hopefully, you know, it doesn't even matter. But interesting to say the least. All right. College football. Where do we want to start? Uh, we're a few weeks away. The The energy is gr- growing. Uh, I got my cheater uniform on, my Michigan Rose Bowl shirt, and my 96 Rose Bowl hat. Mm-hmm. I'm ready. Yeah. And there's been we, – we went through all the weird realignment and stuff that's going crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Geography doesn't matter anymore. It sucks. Uh-huh. But this is where we're at, and this is where we're going to start. The Big 12. Nobody knows who's going to win this conference. I look at that as a positive. Some people look at it as a negative. I like parity. Yeah. And you've got at least four, maybe five teams that can win this conference. Mm -hmm. The teams that I personally hope could be in the top three are Arizona and Kansas. Kansas, they're on their best stretch of football maybe in in school history. Mm -hmm. Lance Leopold came in from Buffalo. Before that, I think Mountain Union or Wisconsin Whitewater. I can't remember which one. But he's been a high-level coach at all levels. Yeah. And ever since he got to Kansas, they've slowly built. And last year, they won nine games, which is unheard of at Kansas. Mm -hmm. They got an exciting offense led by Jalen Daniels at quarterback. Yep. They've got a chance to win it. They're in that four or five that I believe could win the conference. Mm -hmm. The other team is Arizona. They lost their head coach, Jed Fish. He went to Washington. And they replaced him with Brent Brennan from San Jose State, which is one of my favorite coaches on the group of five level. They have one of the most exciting quarterback and receiver combos in college football. You got Ted Arrow and McMillan, T-Mac. He's probably going to be a first-round pick next year. Mm-hmm. 6'4", over 210. He can go up and get it at any time. He can run routes. He's, he's, almost, he's a complete receiver. Yeah. He's a, an elite talent, and I'm happy he stayed at Arizona. Wasn't he the- – Again, this is, this shows my college football knowledge. Didn't he have a big bowl game? Yes, they played. Them? They played Oklahoma, and him and okay. Alfafita went off. Yes, because yeah. I I just remember hearing the name. Like it's obviously not a, not a popular. Yeah, he name. he's a Brandon Marshall, mm-hmm. Alshon Jeffrey. Just like throw they, it in their direction. They their catch do. radius is so crazy, and their hands are so good that there's a great chance they're going to go and get it. Yeah, 
And then Noah Fafita, he's five nine, <laughs> and he's just di- he's dynamic and he's accurate. Mm-hmm. I love shorter quarterbacks that are just high level players, especially on the college level. So I'm excited to see what Arizona can do. But realistically, everybody thinks Utah might win this conference. Mm-hmm. They're coming from formerly the Pac-12, now the Pac-2. Right. They're returning. Um. What's his name? He was hurt last year. And his name is escaping me. <laughs> there we go. He's a seventh year quarterback. Wow. He started for them the year before this one. And everybody's expecting him to get back to where he was. His first name is Cam. I'm forgetting his last name. But they also have Brent Keithy back, who's a sixth year tight end. Hmm. A bunch of old guys coming back to play for one last run. Utah is known for toughness. They're known for good defense mm-hmm. and just enough offense to get them over the hump. Every year they win eight to ten games, and that's the expectation coming into the Pac-12. I see no reason if they stay healthy why they can't win another eight to twelve, eight to ten games mm-hmm. and be in the Big Twelve championship. Now, other teams are going to get hype. One of them being Colorado. Under Coach Prime, you got Shadur Sanders. Travis Hunter is one of the most talented players in college football. Mm-hmm. He'll be another top 10 pick most likely. I, I can't get on the bandwagon in year two. Yeah. They should make a bowl game. Their schedule isn't easy. Yeah. I honestly expect six or seven wins. The people going for like nine or 10, I, I just can't see it. Like you just keep reshuffling with like 40 plus transfers over and over again. Right. You don't have an established culture. Mm-hmm. People are just all in because of a bunch of talent coming together and a bunch of NFL coaches together. I, I I just can't be all in. So I expect six or seven wins for them. But, yeah, yeah, at the top of the conference, you'd expect Utah. Like I said, I'm hyped for Arizona and um, Kansas. Kansas. The other contenders are Kansas State and Oklahoma State. They're always good. They'll always be around there. Mm-hmm. And a sleeper team that I would bring up is Texas Tech. Okay. Joey McGuire is going into his third season as coach. He's raised the level of talent above what Texas Tech is usually at. The offense is still explosive, but they've also risen the level of defense. I don't know if they won the conference, but I think they could win eight or nine games and possibly finish around like third or fourth, Hmm. which is higher than Texas Tech usually finishes. So Utah might end up winning, but – I'd look for Arizona or Kansas to be up there. Really exciting teams with some NFL prospects. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, moving on from there, I'll go to the ACC. Cal, uh, SMU, and Stanford are joining the Atlantic Coast Conference. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. We talked about it last week. Listen, when you think through money, everything makes sense. Oh, yeah. And that's the logic where that we're going by now. None of those teams should be very good in their first year in the they ACC. They could just they could rebrand to the Any Coast Conference. They could, which I just would, thought of that. Which would be very interesting. <laughs> Listen, you need to email somebody yeah. or make some calls because that's the best thing they could possibly do. But listen, the, you got the regulars at the top of the conference predicted. You got Clemson, you got Florida State and Miami. Those are the predict guy, predicted guys at the top of the conference. I'm going to go out on a limb. I think for the first time in almost two decades, Miami might finally get it done. Hmm. Now, their head coach, Mario Cristobal, is not a great in-game coach. <laughs> he had one of the most embarrassing losses in college football history last year yeah. where he could have went for just taking a knee to beat Georgia Tech with like under 30 seconds left, decided to run it, they fumbled, and then Georgia Tech hit basically a hail mary to win in the last few seconds. Yeah, just as just made no sense to the. It's it's absolutely horrible coaching. But they are at a level of talent they haven't been at in over two decades. They got Cam Ward coming in, former F- FCS quarterback that was at Washington State. He's going to be a NFL prospect. He's got a ton of talent, big arm, also mobile. Mm-hmm. They brought in Damian Martinez from Oregon State, one of the more underrated running backs in the country. He's a big-body guy that can get a lot of after-contact yards. 
they they brought in just a high levels of talent in the past two or three years. Mario Cristobal has always been a high level recruiter. Yeah. And he's just slowly built this program to the point where they're all in this year. They're one of the programs that are all in for this season. And if they don't get it done this year, I don't know when they do. Because Miami, like I've said, has been up and down and consistent for two decades. They always have hype going into preseason because they're Miami, and it never happens. Right. I predicted Texas could possibly get over the hump last season, and I think this could be that type of season for Miami just because they have so many pieces coming together. Mm -hmm. They could finally get them over the hump, just like Texas did last year. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to Florida State, they've got a new quarterback, DJ DJ Uyunglele. Started at Clemson, went to Oregon State last year. Jonathan Smith left. He transfers up Florida State. I think people know what to expect from him at this point. He's not going to do anything extraordinary, but his high level is could be consistent. Mm-hmm. He can be a very good quarterback from them. They've lost so much in the draft and just through seniors graduating. I don't know if they could win nine or ten games. They've just they lost a lot. And they, they replaced with some good talent in the portal. But I, I just don't think they're on the same talent level as Miami, even though I don't think Mario Cristobal is better than Florida State's coach. Hmm. Clemson, I, I, just, I don't buy them that much anymore. I think Dabo Sweeney is becoming like a parody of himself <laughs> because he's all about not going in the portal. Right. He's all about sticking with his guys and just mm-hmm. it's all about the program. Got the Tom Izzo effect going on. Listen, things are changing, Dabo. Mm-hmm. Your your O line has been mediocre or bad for like three or four years now. Yeah. After Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence, after that era, you've been really good or just good, and nothing special ever since. Mm-hmm. You focus on certain areas and just seem to skip over others. Now they're still going to be a good team, but I I don't have like high hopes in Cade Klubnik. Mm-hmm. I think he's just a good college quarterback. I don't think he's going to turn into anything special. Yeah. I like their receiving core a lot. I like Phil Moffa as a running back. I don't know if they have any elite talent in those areas. They always have good talent on defense. Mm-hmm. I expect their defense to be good again. I just I don't see the high level ceiling. Yeah. For past Clemson teams that we used to see for them. Yeah. So I I think they finish at mo at best third. Yeah. This year in the ACC, probably lower than that. Right. And they lost Will Shipley, who you know. Did a lot for that yeah, team. Yeah, he's another guy that got picked in the NFL. So, right. yeah, I don't expect much for them. Now, my surprise team in the ACC. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Syracuse. How did you know? <laughs> How did you know? And it's not because Syracuse is any juggernaut. <laughs> they have a first-year head coach, a uh, coordinator that came over from Georgia, and he hit the portal hard. Mm. He has brought in so many players from high-level programs that all weren't maybe, like, incredible at their schools but were pretty good where they were. And I'm just in on what they're doing because of what they're scheduled for the most part. Mm -hmm. They have no, like, elite-level teams on their schedule. Yeah. The best team on the schedule is Miami the last game of the year, and it's at home. Right. And by the end of the year, you never know what could happen. Yeah. Like, Virginia Tech is expected to be really good this year. Mm-hmm. Can't sleep on them. They could finish top three. But it's at home. NC State, they got to go there. That'll be tough. But you open with Ohio, Georgia Tech at home, Stanford at home, and and Holy Cross. And then you win LV. Mm-hmm. That's your first five games. Yeah. Like, if they're not 4-1 and one after that stretch, I'd be disappointed even with everything they flipped over. Like, you've got a quarterback transfer from Ohio State. You got some wide receiver transfers from other big schools. You got Arande Gadsden coming back, who was one of the best tight ends in the country. Mm -hmm. He'll be an NFL draft pick. You've got talent. You've got a high-level Big Ten quarterback. Yeah. And you got a weak schedule. Right. They should be able to at least go go eight and four. Mm -hmm. And that's a very good season for Syracuse. Now, a lot, I've, I mentioned Virginia Tech. They're the team that everybody's expecting to maybe emerge this season. Mm-hmm. They got one of the better quarterbacks in the country predicted to be Kyron Drones. Hmm. He can run. He can pass. He's got a big arm. They got most of their talent. I think they have the most production coming back of, like, any big school, any Power Five conference. 
Mm. They got the most production coming back on offense and defense. So Virginia Tech could also be a team that sneaks up, but I think Miami could get it done this year. Okay. I think they could do it. And also look out for NC State because they I haven't talked about them at all, but I, I like them a lot. They also brought in a lot of transfers. Yeah. And they could also finish top three. I think the top three could be Miami, NC State, and potentially hmm, I'll go with Florida State just because I, I think they'll be really good. Yeah. But yeah, I think Miami could get over the over the hump this season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a conference that's not just solely dominated by Clemson and Florida State anymore. At least right now. Yeah. Yeah, they're in flux like every other conference. So yeah. it is what it is. Trying to figure things out. So Miami, they might let us down again. But I, I believe in Cam Ward and Damian Martinez so much mm-hmm. that I think they can overcome the Mario Cristobal nonsense and win 10 or 11 games, possibly. Yeah. So next conference, the big bad SEC, the conference everybody's afraid of, apparently. Mm-hmm. Not that much anymore to me. But they're bringing in Texas and Oklahoma. Yep. Nick Saban retired. They brought in Kalen DeBoer from Washington. Mm -hmm. And Georgia's back again. Everybody should be afraid of Georgia. Yeah. But controversial opinion, I don't think there's a team in this conference besides Georgia that you should really be afraid of. Okay. Now, you've got some quality teams. Alabama's still going to be good. Mm-hmm. They're Alabama. I mean, Ole Miss is preseason number six. This is the highest expectations they've had in over 40 years, probably since Archie Manning was their quarterback way back when. Mm-hmm. They've got a ton of talent. They brought in some ta- some guys from the portal, too. Lane Kiffin has named his self like the portal champion or something. I can't even remember. But they've gone all in there. Uh, LSU, I don't fully believe in them. I think Garrett Nussmeyer could be a good quarterback, but they just lost two first-round pick receivers. Mm-hmm. I don't think their running back room is that great. And I'm I'm just not a big fan of what they are at this point. So Man, I forgot. Sorry to cut you off. I forgot that Trevor Etienne transferred to yeah. Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> he transferred to Georgia. I, th- I think Oklahoma is in a flux also. They got a new quarterback. They're mm. new to the SEC. I don't expect them to win more than eight games. I like Missouri a lot, but Missouri has never – they've been to the SEC championship. I think they made it twice in the first three years. Mm-hmm. But the SEC was kind of in a down period at that time. I don't think they're deep enough to make a run. They could win nine games. They won ten games last year and nobody expected it. Brady Cook is a really good college quarterback. Mm-hmm. Uh, Luther Burden well, could be a first-round pick as a receiver. He's super talented. But I don't think they're deep enough. I don't see anybody really challenging Georgia. Mm-hmm. I mean, there there are teams I like in this conference. Tennessee, they got Nico Iamalieva. He's going to have a ton of hype. Their offense should be explosive. Mm-hmm. Texas, uh, they're predicted starting running back Torres ACL. Yeah, and they had another guy that was going to be in their rotation that Torres uh, meniscus. Okay, so they're down two running backs. Yeah, I did see that one today. Yeah. Um, so. Even though they have Jaden Blue there, who's very talented, mm-hmm. it's going to be a lot on Quinn Ewers. Yeah. And they, they have one of the most talented receiving cores in the country. Right. But how much can you put on him for a whole season? Yeah. With your running back room being kind of thin. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how much they can. Yeah. So, I'm not really sure how things would fall after Georgia, but I expect Georgia to win the conference. Yeah. They're, what- they're too deep. They're too talented. Right. And without Nick Saban, you don't know what Alabama is going to turn into. You assume they should be able to somewhat, you know, stand steady, but you never know. You never know. It's a it's a new era for Alabama, so it's kind of tough to figure out, I would say. Yeah. And I would say if I had to pick sleepers, my first would be Missouri. It's because of their history that I'm afraid to pick them mm-hmm. to be like the sleeper team that comes over. Ole Miss has a ton of hype, so I can't really pick them as a sleeper. Yeah. But Missouri has the talent and explosiveness to take out some teams and potentially win 10 games again and finish top three in the SEC. Yeah. But their history shows that they don't really have back-to-back seasons where they just keep it rolling. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know if they could do it. I'm going to go out on a limb with my sleeper in the SEC. 
Okay. They have a new head coach. They have a quarterback that has a ton of talent, but nobody really knows how good he's going to be. He's had injury issues. And they flipped over a lot. But I trust this coach so much, and I trust his defensive coaching so much. Plus, they brought over a new offensive coordinator, Texas A&M. Hmm. They have hype all the time. Ever since Johnny Manziel left there, they've had hype every single year. <laughs> Jimbo yeah. Fisher had one really good COVID season and just disappointed every year after that. Mm-hmm. They bring in Mike Elko from Duke. Mm. He went to Duke and within three seasons had them almost ready to win 10 games. Yeah. Unheard of at Duke. They almost they should have beaten Notre Dame. They beat Clemson. And they won, I think it was eight games. They could have won nine if Riley Leonard was healthy. Right. But he wasn't healthy. He mm-hmm. got hurt and was out with the rest of the season. But, yeah, unprecedented success within, like, a three-year span at Duke. Mm-hmm. He turned them around instantly. And I think he's one of the best coaches in the country. They got Connor Wegman. He was a five-star guy from Texas. Mm-hmm. He's in his third year there. If he's fully healthy, I think he could reach his potential. I think they've got a lot of talent. Even there, they also have a running back that had a season-ending inju- injury, so that hurts. But I think they have enough overall talent to overcome that with their skill talent. Mm-hmm. They brought in a guy named Nick Scorton from Purdue who terrorized Michigan last year at Michigan. He was a dog. I, I pointed him out every time they were on defense. He moves on to Texas A&M. I think he's one of the best defensive line players in the country. Mm-hmm. Nick Scorton, watch out for him. He could be up for some awards near the end of the season because he's a game wrecker. He could be a, like near the end of the first round. Maybe mid first round if he has a big season guy. Yeah. It's scary to pick Texas A&M to ever have this type of hype. Mm -hmm. But as a sleeper, I think they could potentially surprise some people and win eight games, potentially nine, and scare a lot of SEC teams Yeah, in this season. So I think Georgia's head and shoulders, the team once again. But we'll have to see who shakes out between like two and four, Mm -hmm. potentially five. Because there's a lot of teams fighting for those spots. Yeah. Any thoughts on the SEC? Um, I, I'm kind of with you. Like it just, it's a it's a weird time, and, and I mean this is for all the conferences, but yeah. especially for the SEC. Like I said, with with Alabama having all that changeover, with you know losing Nick Saban, but returning Jalen Milrow. There's a lot of like up in the air with them. Uh, Georgia's been pretty steady over the years. Texas kind of hitting their stride the last couple of years, but now facing injuries. And then with the injuries, if Quinn Ewers starts to suffer, then people will start calling for Arch Manning again and that yeah. whole drama, I feel like. Um, and then there's like that that whole middle tier of teams that you that have done it in the past, like LSU, Oklahoma, AM even. Um, and then Missouri after having a good season last year, it's like all these teams that we've seen before, but they've been so wishy washy yeah. the last few seasons. Like you never I know which team is just going to emerge out of nowhere. Yeah. I don't like, we kind of thought Alabama was going to take a step back last year and they, you know, they did technically, but they still figured it out by the end of the season to yeah. make it into the playoff. So, you know, you never know with these teams. Um, and then maybe we'll get into the the preseason rankings when when we get there. But like some of these teams are ranked pretty high that I don't know if they're going to stick around there. Yeah. And lastly, before we get to the Big Ten, I want to bring up two players that play in the SEC for South Carolina that I think everybody needs to watch out for. Okay. South Carolina, I don't know if they're going to make a bowl game. They're replacing so much. They're depending on new guys so much. Mm-hmm. They could be good. They could be bad. It could be some in the middle. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But two guys that people need to watch, even if they're bad, I think they're going to be exciting and potential NFL players someday. Mm-hmm. First of all, Lenora Sellers, first time starting quarterback, red shirt freshman. He wears goggles, <laughs> which is awesome. He's from yeah. South Carolina. Mm-hmm. He's like 6'3", over 230 pounds. He's a dynamic runner, and he has a big arm. And people in at South Carolina say he's more accurate than a lot of people think. Yeah. He could be a name that emerges that nobody sees coming. 
So him and a guy that turned down the Olympics to stay with South Carolina football okay. and try to improve with his team. Nick Harbor. He was an all-time elite high school track runner, 6'5", 240, hmm. coming out of high school. Defensive end and receiver coming out of D.C. Came in and decided to play receiver. They let him play whatever he wanted to play, basically. Yeah. Played receiver, had an up-and-down freshman season. He has Calvin Johnson measurables. Hmm. He's 6'5", over 230, and he has, like, legit 4'3 speed, almost 4'2". He was, like, one of the highest-level sprinters in the country in high school hmm. at that size. He's an alien. And he's only like a, I think he might have burned his red shirt. So I think he's a sophomore. Okay. But he's, if he reaches his talent level, mm-hmm. like 6'5, 235, 4'3 speed. <laughs> yeah. Like, what, what do you do with that? Right. He That's has like Kyle Pitts kind of comps. Yeah. But, he, but he, he has all the ability in the world. Mm-hmm. And if him and Lenora Sellers can like reach that connection and have chemistry, they could put up silly numbers. Yeah. Now, once again, I've said, I don't know what South Carolina will be as a whole team, mm-hmm. but those two players I think will be must-see TV at a lot of points. Yeah. So look out for Lenora Sellers and Nick Harbor for okay. South Carolina. All right. Moving on <laughs> to a team with 18 teams now. <laughs> you know, I listen. I can't even keep up with them anymore. They've gotten rid of divisions. They're basically a super conference, which is what everything is turning into. Mm-hmm. The Big Ten. Yeah. Yeah. They've added West Coast teams. USC, UCLA, Washington, and Oregon mm-hmm. are all coming to the Big Ten. Ugh. It's going to be fun. Yeah. I'm I'm excited for the, the talent level that's coming in. Um, Oregon is a very hyped-up team right now. They could be a fun opponent for these teams. Um, UCLA and USC have been meddling. UCLA kind of looked pretty good when they had Zach Charbonnet. Um, and UC USC has had some, you know, like I said, up and downs. Washington, we just saw in the national championship against Michigan. They've had a lot of turnover. Can they get back? Probably they're they're They've been a pretty strong program over the last few years. Um, so it's, I just like that it's a higher talent level overall that's coming into the Big Ten. But it can't be understated that it's going to be wild. And it's going to be a a, a growing pains, probably. Yeah. So before I get into Michigan, mm-hmm. the biggest cheaters in the world, I want to get whatever thoughts you have on the restart, the new era. Yeah. Jonathan Smith and the Wonder Boy quarterback, Aiden Childs. Yeah. What what are your thoughts on what this season could possibly be for Michigan State? So obviously when you have a full program turnover like Michigan State has had, obviously you're 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 excited to get a guy like Jonathan Jonathan Smith in who was ba- basically able to turn around Oregon State. What do you was he there five, six years? I think yeah, I think five or six. Um, and so that's exciting. A guy that's been there, that's had to turn a program around, did a pretty good job. Um, now the Big Ten, everybody says, you know, it's always a different, it's a different beast. Um, but but again, I think I mentioned it before. I think with the way the Big Ten is set up now, with these West Coast teams coming in, we may see an adjustment from the classic Big Ten ground and pound type of offenses. Because you're getting that UCLA, USC, Oregon, like even uh, Washington too, like all of them are more high-powered, just move the ball quick yeah. offenses. That, and nobody knows how that's going to mesh with the right. Big Ten style. So, so like that might adjust some of these teams. And I'm honestly, I'm hoping – Michigan State kind of changes their culture a little bit because they have been that like ground and pound, just gritty grind team. And that's mostly what Jonathan Smith has been. And like play action passing, mm-hmm. lead by the run game, stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm just curious to see if anybody adjusts to that. Um, and so Michigan State coming in now, what are they going to like? 
there are so many questions on their offense. They lost everybody. They Nathan lost, Carter was like the one constant. Yeah, they lost all of their quarterbacks. I know a lot of them probably knew that Aiden Childs was coming in, but you don't have any depth there if Aiden has Listen, some struggles. I'm going to be have a controversial opinion. I like this quarterback group more than last year's. Do you? I don't. They, so, listen, they brought in the kid from North Dakota. That's from Michigan. So that's and the, I like him. I was gonna say that's the <laughs> yeah. only other guy that I know is because listen, he's from Macomb. I've seen him go toe to toe with D one schools for the past three years. Okay, so his name's yeah. Tommy Schuster. Yeah, Tommy Schuster. Um, yeah, he's one that I looked up, and he looks like he could be promising. I believe he's a senior. Um, so at least you get. You know, somebody that's had a lot of reps. These, you got two two true freshmen from the West Coast. Right. Um, so that was my biggest concern is just having all these young guys. But you do have one senior that's been in game action before. Again, that's just if things go sideways with Aiden. But uh, I, I'm not really expecting them to because I think, you know, why wouldn't you just give him a long leash unless he loses the job before the season, you know? Then, then there's no way that's it. They've already they call him our right. quarterback. Right. That's every what I'm practice. Saying. Yeah. Um, but if he came in and all of a sudden just didn't look good or something crazy, then I'd be okay. But once he has the starting job, don't give it away unless there's an injury. Um, like you said, Nathan Carter, kind of the only running back in the room that I'm aware of that I know. Um, I know they brought in a bunch of guys, of course, to fill in the depth, but it's nice to have Nathan Carter back. He had a pretty solid season. I he was kind of their highlight of the offense. He joins the long list, though, for me, of Michigan State running backs that I was more excited about before the season started, hmm. and the final product was not as good as I thought it might be. Well, and they, maybe they, that's had, just, they had a good run of guys that lived up to and maybe w- went just, above their talent level, kind of. Yes, but there's there's a lot of guys in between that I felt like didn't live up to that full potential. I'm going to ask you about that after this because they they had some really good running backs for like six, seven years. I'll ask you about that after this. They have. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll have to go back through the list yeah. anyway to, to talk about the guys that I was hyped about. Anyway, um, and then the same thing with the wide receivers. They, like there's they, no number one guy they, right now. They have basically nobody from last year. Well, from they what I they saw. got Antonio Gates Jr. Yes. He's a sophomore now, yeah. so he's still – you know, getting going. Now, the outside of him, it's a bunch of Now, yeah. to be fair, like, there wasn't any wide receivers last year that really stepped up yeah. um, or, like, really showed out. The one, oh, the one uh, wide receiver that I am a little excited about, besides Antonio Gates Jr. getting more playing time, um, is it Jerron, Jerron Glover? Yeah, the kid from Florida. He had, Big body receiver. He had a couple catches. I won't say games. He had a couple catches here and there that you're like, this kid should get more playing time. So he's one that I'm also intrigued to see if giving him more playing time another year under his belt. Um, yeah, I can't also, remember if how, he's a sophomore yeah, or junior. How much do they play the um the the true freshman from Michigan? I forgot his name. Nick something. Uh, I just had his name in my head. Oh, Nick Marsh. Man. Okay. Yeah, Nick Marsh. I think that's his name. I was going to say, I'm... He was a high four-star kid that decided to stay home. Stay when I... Michigan State. <laughs> When I tried prepping for some of this stuff, like just looking at some of these names, I'm like, I have no idea who Listen, any of these guys Their are most anymore. consistent pass catcher this year might be Jack Velling, the mm-hmm. tight end that Jonathan Smith brought with him yeah. from Oregon State, mm-hmm. and he he's most likely going to be a very good tight end. But yeah, yeah, because like, I mean, their their tight ends were kind of a a tough spot too for the most part. So you know, it, it's up in the air. The offense just it makes me nervous. Um, I guess there's a little more wide receivers that came back than I thought. Like Alante Brown is a senior. Um, Montori Foster is a senior, yeah. but Mont- Montori is a good, he's a good player. Yeah. Um, Alante Brown didn't play a whole lot, but, um, th- so there's guys that have been in the room. Yeah. Jerron Glover is a sophomore. Yeah. So he's kind of one that I'm excited about. I think Jerron Glover, Antonio Gates Jr. And then I don't really know. Too many of Montori might be like the most consistent receiver. Yeah. He's the adult in the room. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nick Marsh, 6'3, 209. Yeah. Okay. He's he's really physically gifted. That would be nice to be able to to maybe get him in there, but you never know. You never know. Um and then 
the defensive side too. It's a lot of mix and match of old guys and transfers. Yeah. Do you know what I like about it though? Mm-hmm. He's not taking risks with guys that had talent and never really played. That's yeah. what Mel Tucker did. He took a lot of chances on guys that didn't play much mm-hmm. and just had a ton of talent. John- Jonathan Smith has brought in guys with production. Yeah. Like they might not be superstars, but they know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, it's it's a new g- regime, so it's it's a lot of figuring things out. If anything. Um, they do get back. Oh yeah. They're returning Cal holiday. Right. So that's a linebacker with experience. Um, can't drop him in coverage, but he can tackle. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, and then what else we got? The DBs are coming back. Yeah. They, they got Samaj Bridgman from Michigan too. I don't, I don't know if he'll play, Okay, but they got him as a linebacker. They lost Jaden Mangum. He went to Michigan. Okay. So, for the most part, like, they might be the same defensively where, like, their defensive line is okay. Their linebackers are probably their best players on the defense. And their DBs might be suspect. They should be at least respectable just based off the fact of the pedigree of Jonathan Smith's coaching. Yeah. Yeah. But. They should at least be decent. Again. The nice thing about this year is we don't really have to worry about it. Yeah. We're just letting things happen. We're seeing things play out, and we're hoping that Aiden Childs is the golden child. And that's what we can bank on. Um, It's nice to have a mobile quarterback at Michigan State. I feel like we've had so many statues over the years. Outside of Lewerke, who's been a guy that could really move? Yeah. And, and they really never use Lewerke's like mobility. Connor Cook somewhat, a little yeah. bit. But, I mean, that's, you know, that's just because you compare him to, like, Kirk Cousins. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so there's, like, they can kind of move. Um, but, yeah, this, this could be exciting that even though, like, the offensive line might not be perfect, Aiden can maybe get out in space, make things happen. Maybe these – these young wide receivers get something going and we figure something out. Cause there's some, there's some big young receivers that are on this team that if they hit, they could become something pretty good. So that, I guess that's the other nice thing. There's a lot of young guys on this team that could turn into something. And then you have a proven program. Now you, you can't say that for sure because of the transfer transfer portal these days, but it's a hope. So this year with Michigan state, it's just a learning process. Let's just see some natural improvements and hope for the best, to be honest. Okay. So, all right. Go ahead with Michigan. We got like 10 minutes. Yeah. I'm not going to take up a ton of time, mm-hmm. honestly. I mean, Harbaugh's gone. Sharon Moore's the new head coach. Mm-hmm. Lake Corum's gone. Donovan, uh, <laughs> Donovan Edwards. Donovan Edwards stayed. I told you, man, me and names. Even on my own team. I can't even name the podcast. (laughs) Donovan Edwards stayed. Mason Graham back. Kenneth Grant back. They'll probably be the best defensive tackle duo in the country. Mm -hmm. You also got a dynamic uh, defensive end uh, pairing with Fred Moore and Josiah Stewart. Uh, Will Johnson might be a first-team All-American. Yeah. Colston Loveland is back. You got a lot of talent back. Mm -hmm. And a great addition in Sean Barham, who's getting hyped to be like a – all-American level linebacker. Mm-hmm. So you've still got high-level talent. But you also lost a lot of guys from a championship team. Mm-hmm. As most champions do. Yes. Nobody expects any superstars to emerge from the receiving core. Mm-hmm. I do expect some good production, though. The big question is the quarterback position. Mm-hmm. Everything I've heard out of reports from camp is that Alex Orgy has been impressive. They haven't named him the starter yet. A lot of teams haven't named starters yet, but Mm -hmm. I expect him to be named the starter. They hit the portal to replace a lot of guys that left in the secondary. Rod Moore tore his ACL, Mm -hmm. so he might be out for the season. They still got Makari Page, who's the leader on the defense, kind of. Yeah. And they brought in some production from other schools to replace that uh, production in the secondary. Mm Mm-hmm. 
I don't expect the championship team. Mm. I don't. It would be great if they could do it again. Mm -hmm. Maybe they could hit some type of hot streak. But I do expect nine or ten wins. When you look at the schedule, realistically, there's only three teams that pose a major threat when you look at them. Mm -hmm. Texas Week 2, the big game. Yep. One of the biggest games of the season. Mm Mm-hmm. They got USC at home, and nobody knows what USC's transition into the Big Ten is going to look like. Right. So it's not anything terrifying. Mm-hmm. Plus, Caleb Williams left. Yeah. Your only road trip to the West Coast is at Washington. Mm-hmm. And Washington is replacing every draft pick they had, and they have a new coach. Yeah. You get Michigan State at, at home. home. You got Oregon and Ohio State. Texas, Oregon, Ohio State. Yeah. Those are the big three that everybody looks at. Mm-hmm. Could they lose those three? Yes. Could they win those three? Yes. Mm-hmm. It's more likely they lose to, they lose two of them. Yeah. At least I think. Mm-hmm. I hope they go eleven and one or twelve and zero, but it's more likely they lose at least two of them. Yeah. And we know it's tough to get into the playoff with two losses. Yeah. Now you can do it because you're in the Big Ten. Yeah, now that it's a twelve team playoff and they play in the Big Ten, I there's keep a chance they could still forgetting get in. about the expansion. Yeah. I I think it should only be eight. They'll probably get in. It, it's, well, yeah. as long as they only if they have go two nine losses. and three, they don't get in. Right, exactly. That Texas game is going to de- determine a lot because mm-hmm. nobody knows what Texas will be after that too. So we'll have to see. But being that they've just come off an electric three year stretch, mm-hmm. I'm still some I'm still optimistic somewhat. I'm going to predict predict 10 and 2. I think they beat Texas week 2. I think they lose to Oregon. I think they lose to Ohio State. Ooh. Oregon is the team I'm afraid of coming in from the West Coast. Yeah. Like I said, I think they have a lot of hype going into yeah, this season. They they recruit better than Michigan and they were the besides Utah, they were the only team in the Pac-12 that played a brand of football that was respected around the country mm-hmm. on the West Coast. They have real talent on defense. They have real dogs. And they also have dogs on offense. They brought in Dylan Gabriel from Oklahoma. They brought in Evan Stewart from Texas A&M. Speedster that can also catch mm-hmm. really good hands. They got talent all over the place. They, yeah. they, they're they at the point where they're reloading instead of rebuilding. Mm-hmm. And they should be confident coming into the Big Ten. And Ohio State, they, listen, they, they went all in. Yeah, they don't. They miss. went all in. Mm-hmm. Urban Meyer and Jim Tressel, arguably their two biggest, besides Woody Hayes, of course, in the modern era, their two biggest coaches. Yeah, both watched them in camp and said this is the most talented roster they've ever had. Which is wild to think with all the players that they've had over the years. Yeah. They have Travion Henderson. They still went and stole Quinshawn Jud- Quinshawn Judkins from Ole Miss. They went and got Will Howard from from Kansas State, mm-hmm. who's not anything special but a very good college quarterback. Yeah, Your receiving core is stacked like it always is. Mm-hmm. But you add on top of that, Jeremiah Smith is a true freshman who is maybe the best true freshman receiving prospect in a decade plus. Mm-hmm. Maybe since like Julio Jones. Yeah, You got to go back years to look at guys that are as good as he is coming in. He could start at almost every school in the country. Mm-hmm. He's 6'3", 215, built to go. And you're talking about a team that's had hmm, Marvin Harrison Jr., Garrett Wilson, Jackson Marvin Smith Marvin Harrison Jackson. didn't have, like, insane hype coming in. Yeah. People just knew he was Marvin Harrison's kid. Mm-hmm. Jeremiah Smith is ready to go right now. Yeah. For anybody. And that's terrifying. Mm-hmm. Ah, man. <laughs> uh, it... How do you, how do you not predict them to win the Big Ten? I mean, even the, even on defense, like they're say, they got a few guys that'll be NFL draft picks in the secondary. Mm-hmm. Their linebacking core isn't anything special, but they've got really good players. They got two players on the defensive line that'll probably be picked: mm-hmm. J T. Tui Molau, and I forgot the name of the defensive end, but he's probably going to get picked too. They just got guys everywhere, man. Yeah, them in Oregon will be the leading predicted guys in the Big Ten. Oh, I forgot. Emeka Ibuka is a senior. Yes. He's the leader of the receiving core. Yeah. It, it's it's terrifying. It, it's really, it's wild. Mm-hmm. 
And if they don't go 12 and 0, <laughs> if they lose more than one game, if they lose one game, their fans will be pissed. But yeah. If they lose two games, Ryan Day is most likely gone. Yeah. And I mean, they're like games to watch out for on their schedule. They can play Oregon um, October 12th. Yeah. That's like, that's one of the biggest games of the season overall. And then they play Michigan football. at the end of the season. Yeah. And you better not. You better not lose to Michigan this year. Listen, Joey. <laughs> they better not lose to Michigan this year. They got all the talent in the world. Yeah. It's championship or bust, honestly. Mm-hmm. They they almost expect to go undefeated. Yeah. I mean, there's again, their schedule is not very hard. It's not. They're opening like six games is is a snore for there's no reason to watch Ohio State if you're not an Ohio yeah. State fan Cause the if first you, five or six weeks. Again, if you look, the ranked opponents, Iowa, nobody cares about Iowa. Yeah. Oregon, that could be a fun game. Penn State, they're not ranked eighth gonna, for more than two weeks maybe. And then, like I said, Michigan at the end of the season. So it's basically two big opponents. And if they drop one of those games, they're in trouble. But – we don't expect them to. So, yeah. Kind of wild. Ohio State won, Oregon two. Michigan and Penn State don't play this year, which is wild. Mm. They don't play. And the homerism in me is going to go with uh, Michigan three. Yeah. But Penn State has a lot coming back. Mm-hmm. You just can't trust James Franklin. Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> I, and, I mean, they have a lot coming back, but at the same time, too, it's like, were they are they really that talented? Like you, you got two NFL running backs. You you have a, a lot of hype in your returning quarterback. Mm. You brought in some transfers for receiver because you you haven't had a very good receiver in a while. Yeah. Defense, you still got some dogs. Penn State always has dogs on defense. Mm-hmm. But they're Penn State. Yeah. I, I can never trust James Franklin to win big games. Mm-hmm. And even though sure this is Sharon Moore's first year. Yeah. And his stretch as head coach, he won big games. And yeah, I'm going Ohio State two, Oregon. I mean Ohio State one, Oregon two, Michigan three hmm. in those standings. And a sleeper for the Big Ten, I will go with I'm not going to Iowa because they've been saying in camp that Cade McNamara's look horrible. <laughs> Rough. I am going to go with Rutgers. Okay. Some people predict that they might win nine games this year, which is crazy. Hmm. But Greg Schiano has rebuilt them once again. Ethan Kaliak Manis came over from Minnesota to be a consistent presence in the QB room. They got a all Big Ten level running back and Kyle Manangai. And their defense is just tough. Hmm. They don't make many mistakes. They play smart. And they're going to make it hard for a lot of teams. And their schedule is manageable. I expect at least eight wins for Rutgers. If they win under, if they go seven and five, it's still Rutgers, so they're making a bowl game. But they got a lot coming in. They got a lot of experience. Greg Schiano is a very good coach, and they're going to out tough a lot of teams. Yeah. So Rutgers is the main sleeper. And watch out for Indiana. Hmm. Kurt Signetti came over from James Madison. Back to back 10 win seasons for the Dukes. Yeah. And he's brought in a lot of help at Indiana for year one. Mm. Do not sleep on Indiana. Okay. I won't. Yeah. Go blue. I'll be obnoxious. Rooting for the cheaters. Yeah. And how much time do we have left? Two seconds. Uh, watch out for App State in the Sun Belt. Uh, watch out for Boise State in the Mountain West. And uh, go Vandy. All righty. Um, next week we could probably do a couple more reviews if we need to. Yeah. Uh, next week will be kind of a weird in between week. And then the week following that probably start talking about more NFL stuff. Um, as the seasons are right around the corner and then we're talking about games, which is wild. Yeah. I'll, I'll, we'll have more college football updates over the next few weeks too. Yeah. Some guys are going to be named starting quarterbacks, more injuries, probably mm-hmm. interesting news out of camps before week one. Yeah. But I can't wait. We're one week closer to football. This has been Views from the Sideline. We'll see you guys next time. Ohio State better beat Michigan.